Um, before I call this special meeting to, to order, I will, a, a general housekeeping note is that the restrooms in this building are located out that door and to the right down the hall, um, just, just in case. Um, I will call to order the September 23rd, 2017 meeting, a special meeting of the City Council of the City of Fredericksburg. Just so those of you who are here who may not know your counselor, I'm going to ask the members of the City Council and our Vice Mayor to stand. They are present. And accounted for. <laughs> The purpose of this special session is to hear public comment on two options for the future of the slave auction block currently located at the intersection of William Street and Charles Street. Council on August 22nd agreed to allow Mr. Fry and me to work with the city manager and the staff to form a plan of action on the slave auction block with a plan due back to council on September 26, 2017. This was in response to Councillor Fry's request, who had placed the removal of the slave auction block item on the agenda for consideration. With City Council's authorization, work immediately began on this topic. The group developed concepts for two options for public consideration and potential City Council action. The two options reflect the basic choice for the future of the slave auction block to remain in place or to be removed. Neither option reflects a do-nothing approach. The plan of action also set out two avenues for community input, including the special city council session being held today for the purpose of receiving community comment and a special purpose website comment page for online submissions. The two options in the public comment plan are discussed in more detail later. Before we begin our listening session, I think it's important to recognize that the City Council decision-making process, specific to the future of the slave auction block, takes place within the larger context of a community dialogue about race, history, and memory. This community dialogue has already begun, and it should continue with leadership from the local religious community, business community, historians, academic institutions, and the local black community and institutions. City council members will wish to support this larger conversation and to participate in it. Today, though, our charge is simple. Again, it is to receive community input on the future of the slave auction block. The work over the past three weeks of Councilor Fry, myself, and the city manager and staff was guided by two foundational touchstones. The first touchstone was the recently adopted Fredericksburg City Council 2036 vision statement. It is worth sharing now and I will read it. Sharing our past, embracing our future. The people of Fredericksburg are building a 21st century urban center on the foundation of this historic city at the fall line of the Rappahannock River. Fredericksburg is the hub of regional economic activity, a city with a multicultural population and a thriving cultural scene, a place that works for everyone, a community where the people are writing the next chapters of Fredericksburg's history. <clears throat> The second touchstone is the city's history of successfully and peacefully working through difficult issues, including issues related to race. It is often said that the city of Fredericksburg is a microcosm of the American story. Excuse me. <coughs> it is often said that the city of Fredericksburg is a microcosm of the American sto story the good and the bad. Our city has an exceptional record and reputation in working through the most challenging chapters in our American history, especially in the latter parts of the 20th century. 
Most often, we have proven to be a model for citizen engagement, civil discourse, and a place where the competition of ideas is embraced and becomes the precursor to action. Let us keep those two touchstones in mind as we open a special meeting. Will you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag located here? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> it is now my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Nathan Spate, who will offer a brief history of the auction block. He was born in Fredericksburg, grew up in the area. Mr. Spate's mother was an assistant principal at Cortland High School, and his, his father, a computer scientist, and his uncle, a friend and colleague of mine, Ronald Jordan, the longtime band director here in this area at UV, and, and at James Monroe. He's a UVA graduate, <clears throat> a real estate attorney today, and he and his wife, I have a young son, I apologize for my boys. <coughs> it's the Fredericksburg pollen, I think. <coughs> we appreciate your spending time with us this morning, Mrs. Spade. Welcome back to Fredericksburg. Please come forward. Thank you, Mary Greenlaw. Good morning. My name is Nathan Spate. I'm a fifth generation freedman, born right across the street at, at the old Mary Washington Hospital. Judge John Scott was my neighbor and a mentor. I was baptized at Shallow Baptist Church, New Site. And as Mayor Greenlaw uh, alluded to earlier, the late great Ronald Jordan, who was the band director here at James Monroe High School, was my uncle. This is home, and I'm honored to be here today. What is a fifth generation freedman? That means that my family has existed in the fabric of American history for over five generations, for a long time. It also means that unlike the sanitized version of textbooks published by McGraw Hill for use in American history classes, my ancestors did not come to America as quote unquote workers looking for freedom and better opportunity. My ancestors were brought here to, to uh, my ancestors were brought here to create the opportunity to serve as the economic engine for the successful expansion of the North American colonies. Slavery paid for a substantial share of, of Slavery paid for a substantial share of the capital, iron, and manufactured goods that laid the basis for American economic growth. Taxes were levied on slave transactions which funded local and state governments. By 1860, there were more millionaires, slaveholders all, living in the lower Mississippi Valley than anywhere else in the United States. In the same year, the nearly four million American slaves were worth some $3.5 billion, making them the largest single financial asset in the entire U.S. economy, worth more than all manufacturing and railroads combined. Slavery is the womb that gave birth to the labor that fueled the American dream. The atrocity of American slavery, however, on a or in our country and our community cannot be computed by raw numbers, data, or fancy algorithms. In addition to being a visceral and open attack on American values, morality, and courage, American, American slavery was a system of terroristic violence aimed at a group of people only because of the color of their skin. Black bodies, black families, and black institutions were brutalized and murdered. Children were kidnapped, families torn apart, 
Women raped, people mutilated, castrated, murdered, tortured, and terrorized. Even more perniciously, American slavery was not confined to one generation, but to generations of families like mine. American slavery not only brutalized the enslaved, it also infected our American communities as the poison of racism was secreted into our veins. The poison continues to erode at our moral and collective conscience as Jim Crow laws, segregation, the war on drugs, mass incarceration, and the way that we relate to our neighbors are direct byproducts of slavery. Slave auctions served as the public intersection of slavery's indecency and moral depravity. Black men and women were brought from a pen, chained up, in turn to stand on raised platforms so that they could be purchased by buyers. In many cases, they were stripped naked and subject to unwanted poking, prodding, and unwanted touches. Henry Bibb, an American slave, gave a firsthand account of the horrors he witnessed at auction. I quote, another man was called up whose wife followed him with her infant in her arms, beseeching to be sold with her family, which proved to be all in vain. They ordered the woman first to lay down her child and mount the auction block. She refused to give up her little one and clung to it as long as she could while the cruel lash was applied to her back for disobedience. She pleaded for mercy in the name of God, but the child was torn from her arms and its mother amid the most heart-rending shrieks from the mother and child on one hand and the bitter oaths and cruel lashes from the tyrants on the other. Finally, the poor child was torn from the mother while she was sacrificed to the highest bidder. In this way, the sale was carried on from the beginning to the end." end quote. Fredericksburg was not immune from slavery's poisonous fangs. In the year 1840, more than 40% of Fredericksburg's population was enslaved. The active market for slaves, frequent advertisements for sales, and known locations of other auctions indicate that slave auctions were held throughout our town. The brother of the future Confederate Secretary of War, John Seddon, described Fredericksburg as, quote, the best place to sell slaves in the state, end quote. As he advertised for the sale of slaves on the corner of Charles and William Street, the same, very same site, that we're discussing here today. There is direct evidence of slave sales occurring on the corner of Charles and William Street on at least nine different occasions, as well as oral history. Newspaper advertisements and notices show at least 12 separate sales of enslaved men, including men, women, and children at this corner between 1847 and 1862. Fanny Brown was 10 years old when she witnessed a slave auction occurring in Fredericksburg. After a large crowd of whites gathered, a black man named Jim was forced to take off his shirt and was subjected to prodding and pulling and poking while they forced his mouth open as he was sold to the highest buyer. Even more specifically, the artifact at the center of this discussion, the slave block, has been written about by local historians as far back as 1908. Local historians S.J. Quinn and John Gulrick Jr. both describe the use of the block as a marketplace for slaves. The former owner's son of the Planters Hotel, the original three-story building that sits at the corner of William and Charles Street, also wrote about seeing former slave George Triplett sold on that very same slave block in 1862. Although the intent of the installation of the slave block is debatable, it is undeniable that the corner of William and Charles Street 
was the site of multiple slave auctions and the slave block artifact was, was directly used to facilitate those sales. As I drove down uh, or home this morning on 95, I passed a large Confederate flag waving, welcoming me home. It amazes me how we continue to tolerate the sanitization of our history. We sanitize our history when we engage in games of intellectual dishonesty. Some claim that we honor our heritage, uh, claim that we honor our heritage and monuments and tributes to fallen members of the Confederacy. These arguments conveniently ignore the fact that not only is secession an act of treason, many of the Civil War era monuments were not erected to commemorate those men who lost their lives or the families that were divided by war. Their purpose was to celebrate white supremacy and inspire terrorism within a group of people. Robert E. Lee said in response to a proposed Gettysburg Memorial, I quote, I think it wiser not to keep open the sores of war, but to follow, a, but to follow the examples of those nations who endeavored to obliterate the marks of civil strife, to commit to the oblivion the feelings engendered, end quote. More recently, the families of Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and Jefferson Davis have asked that the monuments of their ancestors be moved to museums where they can be placed in proper context. In this era of tolerance, we continue to conflate noble men with ignoble causes. The Vice President of the Confederacy, Alexander C. Stevens, said in what's known as his cornerstone speech, quote, our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite ideas as those of slavery foes. Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. He went further. The battle over slavery, quote, was the immediate cause of the last, of the late rupture and present revolution. The foundation of the Confederacy and what ultimately caused its secession thus should not be sanitized. The saying goes, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Several weeks ago, in what looked like a scene from Birth of the Nation, torch-wielding white supremacists stormed my undergraduate school, the University of Virginia, assaulting black and white students and causing havoc in the name of heritage. Today, Fredericksburg serves as the battlefield and the war on how we tell our community's collective history. It requires facing our collective past together with intellectual honesty, emotional integrity, and truthfulness. We can either become relics of the past or beacons for future generations. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spade. Our history is living history here, as we well know, because we walk in the steps, the very steps that the leaders of this nation took. We walk in the very steps that James Washington took when he walked to freedom to cross the river. And we pass the artifacts. And as Mr. Spate has reminded us, we must not, we must not romanticize it, but we must face it honestly. 
and appropriately and respectfully. Um, the options that we are considering today revolve, involve a, a, an historical artifact. Um, and I will read them for you. You're familiar with them. You have come to speak to them. And we have had over 400 comments made online to, the, to this specific and, and very specific matter. Option A is to keep the auction block in its current location, but use the existing right of way to build a more prominent public space that buffers the encounter and places the artifact in context. This option envisions interpretive panels, protective measures, and a better design for pedestrian flow. Option B is to replace the block with a historical marker and directions to its new location, likely likely but not definitively, because we still haven't worked it out, um, in the Fredericksburg Area Museum. The museum is planning a permanent exhibit to tell the story of what the working people of Fredericksburg. Uh, the rules of order for the day, for those who've signed up to speak, uh, will be very much as we do in any public hearing. We'll, our, our clerk will call the name from the list, from the list, and the order in which you signed up. As your name is called, please come forward to either one of the microphones. If you're seated on this side of the auditorium, come forward to this microphone and exit the middle aisle. If you're seated on that side of the auditorium, please come down the far uh, aisle and use the microphone on that side of the room. Um, we will actually be calling two people at a time. The first person will come forward and be ready to speak. Um, and the first person will come forward. The second will be called so that the second can be in line and ready to speak as soon as the first person ends. And that's so we proceed efficiently and in a timely manner so we don't, you don't have to spend all day here. Um, each speaker is limited to a three-minute time period. And we have a little timer here that's got a, a, a green light, a yellow light when you're 30 seconds is when you're 30 seconds away from the end, and a red light. Um, please observe that. Please yield the floor when the clerk of council indicates that your time has expired. As always, well, speakers who represent a group are encouraged to ask the other members of their group to stand and be recognized. But I will request that you not make comments that are not relative to the specific options that we are talking about today. And I will ask you please not to applaud or make any other noises so that we can keep the flow of the comments going and be respectful of every opinion that's expressed here today. I'm going to recognize now Dr. David A. Sam, who will serve as our facilitator today. Dr. Sam is no stranger to any of us. He's served as president of Germana Community College for the past decade. He has a BA in English, a minor in history, an MA in English, and earned his PhD in higher education leadership cognate in labor relations. Prior to his experience in education, he spent 15 years in retail management including as a partner in a, in a retail store. As an educator, he spent more than three decades as an English professor, an academic dean, a vice president for academic affairs and workforce development, and of course, as president of Germana Community College. He's a writer. He's credentialed as a consultant facilitator, focusing in er areas such as diversity, leadership development, quality improvement, mission building, and strategic planning and town team and community building. Thank you, Dr. Sam, for being with us this morning. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm not here as an expert. Um, I'm here to moderate. History is a conversation of the present with the past. 
history is a conversation of those in the present about the past. Uh, these issues that face us are not simple. The two options uh, are different options. Those of you that advocate one won't be happy necessarily if the other one is selected. But we are a good community. I'm amazed, gratified, and, and uh, humbled to be a member of this community. And I know that we will be respectful of each other. We'll set an example for other communities about how, how to have a difficult conversation about the present and the past and the past in the present. Um, if you feel the need to applaud or boo, it will impact potentially the next person and make him or her less willing to speak their own emotional truth, their own thoughts. And that's one of the reasons why that we ask you not to do that. And uh, if I have to, I will try to remind us to be uh, respectful. Uh, I don't think I'll, I'll be necessary. I think I will, because this is a good community, spend most of my time simply sitting here and listening with you. Um, Madam Clerk. Okay. Sebastian Cisnero and Peter Fisher. Please give your name. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sam. I'm Peter Fisher. Uh, I didn't realize I was going to be first up here. It's sort of intimidating. Um, but I'd like to thank uh, you, Dr. Sam, and Mayor Greenlaw and the City Council for uh, hosting this forum today. I'd also like to thank Mr. Space for his incredibly moving and powerful remarks. Um, I applaud the city for soliciting community input on the issue of the slave auction block. In the online survey, I voted for option A, uh, but with some reservations and qualifications. I don't think it should be moved to the museum. Uh, that requires a small fee to enter, which not everybody will be willing or perhaps even able to pay. Uh, also, I think there should have at least been an option uh, for leaving the block exactly as it is. Uh, I think, with all due respect to Mayor Greenlaw, that doing nothing sometimes is the best thing to do. The block stands as a stark reminder of the evil that human beings can do. I remember when I moved here some 22 years ago and first saw it uh, on that bustling corner. It was a very sobering uh, moment. Places like Auschwitz and Dachau still stand where they were built as a permanent reminder that we should never forget such horrible crimes. And so I think uh, there ought to be at least an option for leaving the block exactly as it is. Uh, if that option has been taken off the table, then so be it. Second, if there are to be some sort of explanatory panels or the like, who will write the text and what will it say? I, will hope, I hope you would solicit further citizen input uh, on that aspect before finalizing the text of any uh, explanatory uh, displays. Similarly, if there are to be protective measures, what will they look like? Uh, I hope they'll not totally obscure the block from public view, uh, and again, further community input on proposed design would be appreciated. Finally, on the general issue of monuments and artifacts, I support the removal of Confederate monuments and memorials from public land, but my worry has been and will be, where does all this stop? We've already seen statues of Columbus vandalized, Thomas Jefferson draped in black uh, crepe, and so on. Whatever the ultimate disposition of the auction block, I hope we think carefully about a potential slippery slope. Thank you very much again for the opportunity to speak here today. Thank you. Ernest Woodson and Michael Carter, Jr. Good morning. Let me try that again. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ernest Woodson III. Uh, I happen to be a pastor in this area, 27 years. I served eight years in the military. I also
also substitute teach in Fredericksburg, Virginia. I grew up in Caroline County. I live in Spotsylvania, but I work in Fredericksburg. My mother lives in Fredericksburg, so I have strong connections here to this city. Um, I'm kind of speaking not only for myself, but also for those that are on the outskirts of Fredericksburg, because Fredericksburg has been a center for the surrounding counties for this area. So I don't think that this is just a Fredericksburg uh, inclusive uh, decision, but I think it is for all the surrounding counties who have frequent Fredericksburg for many things, for their shopping, for visitation, for movie theaters, back when there were two movie theaters on um, Caroline Street or whatnot. I come from a pretty prominent and, and educated black family. In uh, the 50s and 60s, my great-grandfather owned two restaurants in Caroline County, Cosmopolitan Inn and Villesbar Inn. I said that because my grandfather, which was his son-in-law, used to own a bus line that would um, take uh, people from Caroline County and bring them to Fredericksburg to the movie theaters on Saturdays and give them a chance to, to uh, shop and walk around and whatnot. So there were strong connections here. Um, I don't want to sound redundant or continue to go over things that have already been said and will be said, but I myself I'm a believer in removing the, the block. And my reasoning is because um, in 1965, let me say this, my sister and I integrated, we were the first two blacks to integrate Caroline Elementary School in Caroline County. I had come from Detroit, Michigan in an integrated school already. So when my mom came back home, which this is home, then she said, well, you all go to Caroline Elementary. Um, I encountered a lot of good things that, that happened. Uh, I wasn't raised in a, in a uh, prejudice or biased family, so I was really naive to a lot of things that were going on. Uh, just for a, a, a quick uh, um, moment, I can 30 be, seconds. Excuse me? 30, 30 seconds. seconds. Thank you. Let me get to my point then. Um, education is very strong in, in all our lives, scholastic and biblical. And uh, that's the key to freedom, education, understanding. The Bible even tells us, as a man of God, I have to say, and all that we get, get an understanding. Uh, if I had a noose in my hand, we would all react to that. If you saw a noose outside on the, on, at the school, you would react to that. To me, that's, that block represents the same thing that a noose represents. Sorry, I can't say more. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Michael Carter, Jr. Uh, like Reverend Woodson, I'm a resident of Caroline County. Uh, I've lived the past five years in Ghana, West Africa, to really search my roots and figure out why what happened happened um, in terms of the enslavement of my people. I'm a proponent of option A, keeping the block in its place uh, for several reasons. Uh, being a resident of Caroline County and living in Woodford, Virginia, I'm surrounded by Jefferson Davis Highway, Stonewall Jackson Shrine, Fort A.P. Hill. All of those were leading Confederate figures that I never knew were really Confederate. Reverend Woodson, you know, First Baptist Church and Stonewall Jackson Road, and I mean, I'm, <laughs> it, it, it covers our very being. And to have a symbol like this, a block, where potentially my ancestors may have moved through there and had that removed is removing a part of my history. I traveled 5,000 miles to go to Ghana, West Africa to look for my history. And I get there and there's a Fort Fredericksburg. I'm blown away. <laughs> Our people probably came from Fort Fredericksburg to Fredericksburg. And without having this marker of uh, a slave block, who would know? None of us would know. And as much as this history is emotional to many of us and hurts, it's needed to really restore our dignity, our pride, our sense of personage, of being a person. So I'm definitely encumbered and I'm grateful for you all to give us the opportunity to express ourselves and our desire to really you know, find our history again. Because it's not, as Vermont Woodson said, it's not a Fredericksburg issue. Uh, if you've ever seen Roots, Roots' story takes place in Spotsylvania County, Virginia. 
So a lot of the African Americans' roots in this country take place in Fredericksburg and the surrounding areas. And if we move this block, we tend to remove our roots out of the same situation. And as we go, I guess, even to a spiritual understanding of what this means to many of us, if you go to Deuteronomy 28 and 68, it talks about slavery. And if, also, if you go to Exodus 21, it also talks about slavery and how to treat slaves and why you shouldn't have slaves. It's a spiritual issue, it's a historical issue, and it's a pride issue that we all need to take into account that is greater than just our personal feelings and emotions. It really is our history. And just as much as those flags wave of Confederacy and oh, I think on Stafford or whatever, you know, we need this block here to help us to sustain our own sanity, our own understanding as a person. So I definitely encourage 30 seconds. Thank you. Encourage keeping the block there because without it, you put it in a museum, no one would see it. I know I would never go to Fredericksburg Area Museum. Just just being real. Museums don't get the type of attendance that walking down the street and seeing a nice uh, platform, a nice uh, presentation of some sort to say this is a historical marker here, that your history is greatly affected because this is not just the history of America, but the history of capitalism in America. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas Morgan and Robert Lamb. morning. Everyone get their morning coffee? <laughs> uh, like the clerk had said, my name is Thomas Morgan. I am a student at Germanic Community College and I am a resident of Spotsylvania County. Uh, I am not a native to Spotsylvania County. I had originally uh, grown up in Connecticut. Uh, we moved here about 10 years ago in 2007 and I got a very, very blunt lesson in this history of our country. Where I lived, we knew that the North had won, that slavery was abolished, but we never learned the impact of it. And it wasn't until I came here that I began to understand that. Like some have stated before, I agreed at first that this block should remain where it is so that it can be a lesson to people like myself of just how heavily this impacted our nation, how self-inflicting of a wound this was. But as I began to ask questions and truly ponder it, I began to ask, is this truly the way to step forward in healing that wound? I later came to the conclusion that no, it is not. Although I do believe that this auction block, this dark relic of history, should be there for everyone to see and should remain a reminder, in order for our community to begin healing as the cells do in the body, it must be removed so that the community can continue forward. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. I should note that was a great student from Germana Community College. <laughs> but th that would be prejudice, so I won't do that. Good day. My name is Robert Lamb. Five generations of my family have lived at a place in Spotsylvania County where I, I came from today. It's an old plantation called St. G. And naturally, it had quite a few slaves. So I'm, since childhood, I've been interested in the question. My grandmother, I'm 74 years old now, my grandmother used to take me into Fredericksburg, among other things, to see that slave block. And I might say I've never seen anyone give it, accord it, anything other than respect. The auction block should stay where it is, not only due to its antiquity, but also because it invites serious discussion and reflection, and is seen by many at the busy intersection. Not all of history is sweet. Some is bittersweet and some is sour. Fredericksburg is fortunate to have many unique historical sites that offer great appeal to locals and tourists alike. None more dramatic and powerful than the auction block. 
located at, at the busiest intersection in, in Fredericksburg, arguably. The city's <coughs> decision-making on the auction block takes place supposedly within the larger context of a community dialogue on race and history. Therefore, it is ironic and contradictory indeed that those who ill-advisedly would remove it at the same time profess to desire more open and honest conversation about race. Yes, yet they would whisk it away to a museum that few people visit. In fact, the museum had even closed at one point and squirrel it away where few people could see it. And the advocates of removal are oblivious or uncaring, apparently, about the reality that such an action would violate one of the basic tenets of historic preservation. If you remove something from the site where it was located, where its context is really powerful, then you severely diminish the artifact itself. Something like the London Bridge, which now sits out in the southwestern desert of the United States. This, thus, those people who would support removal, supposedly in order to protect it and respect the auction block, 30 mi seconds. miserably fail on both accounts. I'm against the interpretive panels as well because it in invites subjectivism. The, the block itself is very powerful, and it needs no adornment around it. The wording, however, happens, or the plaque ha should be changed because it should say, formerly Fredericksburg principal auction site for slaves and other property, because it was, e even in 1862, it was still there, and slaves were considered other property. Thank you. Ann Little and Ann Ahern. Good morning. My name is Ann Little. I live at 726 William Street here in the city, 22401. I do not feel I should give an opinion as to whether the slave block stays in its current location or is moved to the museum. I think that decision should be made by the descendants of those slaves. The African American community should have the strongest voice in this decision. Their ancestors were brought and sold like animals. Black families were torn apart. Black children were given as gifts to white people. This is our country's shame, and this is our, the perpetual sorrow of the black community. If even one black person finds this slave block re reprehensible, I say move it. I've heard many people mention the example of the German concentration camps and how they were left in place by the German government to remind them all about their shameful heritage. The difference is the concentration camps are completely there with the ovens and everything. All we have is a block. We don't have the chains or the whips or the cages. We only have a block, and it isn't enough to tell this story. On the corner of Kenmore and Hanover, we have three panels that tell the story of a ditch. How are we going to possibly tell this complex story of slavery on an extremely busy corner, and it's a dangerous corner at that, with just a couple panels? I would like to propose to council that they consider making this a much bigger project and tell the complete story. Place 25 panels around our city. There were other locations that had slave auctions in the city. There is a story of the Underground Railroad and the struggle of the slaves to escape. We need to tell the whole story. John Hennessy from the U.S. Parks Department does a walk that interprets the slavery issue in our city. It's a beautiful project. He's a magnificent storyteller and historian. We could get, take some direction from his, his uh, walk. We could start a panel at the corner of Charles and William and lead people around the city to teach and enlighten them about this terrible time in our history, and at the museum where the slave block could be located and continue to tell the story in a larger way. I believe with education comes understanding, with understanding comes empathy, and with empathy comes forgiveness and acceptance. Many people still do not know the story of slavery and the horror that was imposed, 30 seconds. That was imposed upon the victims of slavery. Many, including me, 
do not really understand the African American community and how they feel about the shameful way that they were imprisoned and enslaved. We need to change this. We need to tell their story and ask that community to forgive us for what we did to their ancestors. We need to heal, and I believe Council has taken the first step to making this happen with this forum. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Ann Aher, and I live on Cornell Street in the city. I'm conscious of my white privilege but I'm not conscious enough. When I walk by, the auction block, I feel shame and horror every time. I cannot avoid encountering and feeling the pain of And my delusion of well-being is pierced. I experience living history. And I'm humbled and saddened. I prefer that you leave the auction block where it is to be encountered and experienced in its authentic location, but mostly I urge you not to put it in a museum where we can avoid it and choose not to experience our dark past. In acknowledging my white privilege, I admit that I cannot know what my African American neighbors are feeling when they encounter the slave block. Their voices must be heard and honored. I visited a small and meditative park with beautiful water views recently in Tacoma, Washington. It commemorates a cruel period in 1885 when 200 Chinese were expelled from Tacoma. Their lives were destroyed. There are explanatory displays woven into the beauty of the park so that there can be understanding of why the park is there. While I was there, there were four or five young African-American women joyously doing a photo shoot. <laughs> Sorry. In this Asian-inspired park of reconciliation. It was deeply affecting for this white woman from the East Coast to be in this park shortly after Charlottesville. 30 seconds. We could do something like that, too. I have copies of an article about it if you're interested. I believe that we ignore the cruelty of our history at our peril. Thank you for the Thank opportunity. You. To Thank speak. you. Pamela Douglas and Janine Steer. I'm Janine Steer. I live in Fredericksburg City. I'm a lover of American history. I'm probably the only person in two generations of my family right now that love genealogy. So I know my roots and my friends who can't chase their roots because of people being brought over here and slavery is painful. I've experienced that with them and can never understand what it's like. I thank Mr. Spate for giving us the thorough history that he gave us here, but I would be highly disappointed if anybody speaking on the subject found any of what he said surprising. We can always learn from people giving us history lessons like he did this morning. And I learned a couple new things too. But it wasn't surprising. The dark history is real. And we need to teach people that every chance we get. Now my husband and I decided to retire here in Fredericksburg when we're not fully retired, but when we retired from the Army. We chose Fredericksburg, Virginia to create our new life in the next chapter in our lives because of its robust history of all varying kinds, and we love the city for it. There's not one visitor we have that we bring to this town that does not go by that corner. And I give them the history lesson, not as powerful as Mr. Spate did this morning. I can't invoke the same true understanding of that, but as real as I can make it, because we have relegated chains and whips and all other kind of vestiges to museums where stories are not told fully. 
to everybody who has a chance to have a surprise encounter with something that they may not have been there. So let's not do that to this artifact. The impact of the artifact in its current location is supported by all the words that you'll hear here. It's undeniable. It impacts people in different ways. The lessening of the impact by the removal of the stone is supported by the wording of people wanting each option. You can hear that in their voices, just from different points of view. We have a decision to make here today. The council has a decision through our input. Do we want to keep the full impact of what occurred at that location by keeping an original artifact at the original location, or do we want to lessen the historical impact by removing the artifact, losing the opportunity to tell its story in the context of both that carriage stone and being a vestige for auctioning what people in those days consider property. It's disgusting. The option of improving the historical marking affords the opportunity to share the facts of this site as put forth by John Hennessy's article, supported by the research and advertisement first-person accounts. 30 seconds. It's the site of this location is described as auctions in front of the hotel. The discouraging or dis disparaging behavior that goes on, the rude behavior that goes on is another uh, reason I've heard for removal. That's not going to end. It's our job to come up to somebody that's acting inappropriately, no matter whether it's a war memorial, a tombstone in a cemetery, or this location in our city. Anybody asking, acting disparagingly and rudely, it's our jobs as adults, as leaders, as mentors, to tell them to stop it. And we need to continue that now, no matter how the site is built out. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Emma Han Campbell and Ira Weston. And still we rise. Good morning. My name is Ira Weston. I grew up in Fredericksburg, and I'm a retired New York City high school principal who has returned home, unharmed. I adamantly, and more importantly, proudly support keeping the slave block, auction block, in its present location. I am a direct descendant of the last African slave sold off the block, namely George Washington Triplett. I have a death certificate of my cousin, who is a triplet, that's part of the documentation of that. Not only is the slave block personally important to my family, it is an artifact of the institution of slavery and part, as our mayor said, of a larger area of discussion. Namely, how do we as Americans situate any momentous historical tragedy in our shared history, and there have been many other than slavery. How do we situate these tragedies in our present uh, situation that supports a positive move into the future? For example, 9-11, and I saw the second plane hit with my own eyes from the roof of my school in Brooklyn. Pearl Harbor, the Challenger disaster, the internment of Japanese citizens, Custer's Last Stand, the American Indian Trail of Tears, the Alamo, the U.S. Civil War, and the institution of slavery. Presently, we view these tragedies in a way that highlights the greater values and ideals of our country and places them in historical perspective. We honor the national ideals of sacrifice, valor, honor, courage, dignity, and sacrifice. Do we close down Pearl Harbor? or our Civil War battlegrounds? Do we see men over the ground zero from 9-11? Do we tear down the Alamo? Do we deny that slavery occurred in our history? Do we put our head in the sand? Or do we recognize slavery as an example of a national tragedy that we deal with openly and honesty? Almost every society on earth, from tribal society, toward the most highly developed can attest to some form of slavery in their history. 30 seconds. Either being slaves themselves or slaveholders. There is no dishonor in being held in forced slavery. The dishonor is design, designing, denying one's history. 
If we wish to remove the slave block because of its distasteful reminder of our history of slavery, should we also advocate the removal of the book of Exodus, the story of an enslaved people from our Bible, for the same reason? Exodus teaches us to value our history for what is part of God's plan for his people. Let me end by saying, if we, if we deny history, we are doomed to repeat it. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Juggins, Joe Hensley. My name's Linda Juggins, and it's going to be hard to beat what I just heard, but um, I was born in Hartford, Connecticut, moved here and live in Fredericksburg by choice because I love this city. I am the descendants of my great, 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 great grandparents who purchased land in Stafford County where my parents lived from their previous owners. My parents live on Juggins Road, which intersects what's called Dock Stone Road. My Previous relatives were owned by Doc Stone's mother. My parents see that sign, that street sign every day, and when I drive to their home, I see Doc Stone Road and Juggins Road, the past and the future. You got to accept your past, and then I see the future, Juggins Road, where they are, how far they've come. And so when I see this block, it could have been my descendants who were sold there, and I think of them and how strong they were to have survived. I can't imagine living your whole life as a slave, your children as slaves, but somehow they had the will to survive. And so when I see that stone, I see survivors. I'm a descendant of survivors. You put something in a museum, people don't go to museums. I love museums. Most of my friends hate museums. Don't go to museums. It pushes things aside. You leave it there. So that when people visit Fredericksburg, my friends come, we stop by there. I show them that so they see that along with Carl's ice cream and everything else, I believe, in leaving the block where it is. I don't mind it staying the way it is if you want to do something fancier, but Fredericksburg is such a beautiful city with so much history. Leave it alone. That's, that's my view. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Joe Hensley. I live here in Fredericksburg, and I'm the pastor of St. George's Episcopal Church in downtown Fredericksburg. Um, and I'd like to thank the, the mayor and the city council for convening us this morning and for responding so quickly when this issue was, was raised again. It's been raised several times. Um, I'd like just to invite us to look around the room and see who's here. I think it, it's hard in the auditorium. To, to know. So if you just turn around in your seats uh, and just see all the people that have gathered at 8.30 in the morning, I think, uh, I think it's, it's a wonderful thing to see folks who are willing to come out um, and, be, and be willing to, to listen to one another this morning. So thank you. I'd like to thank uh, members of our law enforcement community and our first responders for being here this morning and um, watching over us because we live in times that are difficult and Unfortunately, we have to take precautions, and so it is a, it is a charged environment. Um, I'm not here to speak for or against um, the, the options that are listed. I'm here um, in many ways to say I think we need um, a longer process of, of listening that the mayor alluded to. We're in the, this is not a process that is, begins today, nor will it end today. Um, a process of listening deeply and speaking our truth uh, in a context where we can talk to, talk with one another rather than at one another. And so I'm, I'm part of a group of faith leaders that has been meeting for conversation for the last couple of years. And if there are any faith leaders in the room this morning, I'd like to invite you to, to join those conversations. And, and we're very interested in helping to, to lead a process, being a part of a, a process going forward. I feel like this, this, this block is the tip of an iceberg. And we all recognize, I think, that underneath this block is a, is a lot of history, a lot of pain, a lot of, of stories that need to be told. And, uh, and, and we need a context where we can do that, um, where, it is, uh, where we're not facing such a, um, such a pointed decision. I, I will say that the either A or B choice is not as satisfying for me. And my, uh, my suggestion, uh, maybe a C, 
might be, what if, what if we moved the block temporarily to the museum? Let a process unfold in which the imagination of this community uh, could unfold and we see ways in which we might, uh, there might be an option that we haven't dreamed of yet, of, of the future of that block. So I, I encourage our, um, our leaders to, uh, to consider that. I'd like to close with a quote. Professor Julius Lester said, history is not just about facts and events. History is also a pain in the heart, and we repeat history until we are able to make another's pain in the heart our own. Thank you. Rachel Lohman, Angelique Covert Bryant. Good morning. <laughs> a little nervous. <laughs> uh, my name is Angelique Culver Bryant, and um, I'm from the state of California. I'm from the melting pot. Um, and I just want to say that um, in 2000, I, well, I, was, I was married to a Marine, so I've been all over the world, a lot of places, um, seen a lot of different things, including Peace Park, Hiroshima, Japan, where they dropped the atomic bomb. Um, and they didn't hide their history either. Um, in fact, they made a park out of out of what happened there. They actually called it Peace Park, where there's a museum that memorializes what happened in Hiroshima, Japan. Very sad. Anyway, I just want to say I moved here in 2000, and um, I. Um, was going on a walk one day and actually walked upon, walked upon, walked up on the auction block. And I cannot tell you how I felt emotionally. Um, I, it just took me to my knees. I, I've never seen anything like it. Because like I said, I'm from California, which is kind of the melting pot. Everybody was pretty happy there. Um, anyway, um, I want to say this, I've listened to everybody and when I first came here, I was against, move, against leaving that auction block there. I thought it should be moved. I thought how could people expect us to walk down the street every day and think this is okay? Why would someone want us to accept this horror that's standing on this corner? Um, it made me think of all the horrible things that have happened in the past, the atrocities, people um, being separated from their loved ones, children being ripped away from their parents, just things that hurt to the core. But as I stood here and listened today, to the people that live here, the people that, that have had to deal with this all of their lives, I've changed my mind. I think it should stay. And I think it should stay because it is a stark reminder of our past and a place where we shouldn't ever go again. My family pushed me to come here today because seconds. they knew that this is what I would say. And I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I think that um, you're doing the right thing. And I think that the city council and the city of, of, of Fredericksburg for opening up this discussion has done a wonderful thing because it needs to happen. We need to start talking. We need to start talking about what's going on and we need to make some changes because this is not okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ronald Smith, Ronette Cooper. Good morning. Before you start my clock, I need to ask a question. Is anybody else having trouble hearing the speakers? So I don't know if we can move the mics closer or what we can do, but I was having trouble hearing. That's why I'm asking the question. I'm Ronald E. Smith. I have a PhD in education. 
now that I've gotten the most insignificant thing out of the way, I will tell you actually who I am. John J. Wright Consolidated School, Spotsylvania County. Spotsylvania High School graduated 1970. Germano Community College, 1973. So I have an interest in this community. I identify Fredericksburg as my hometown. Spotsylvania, where I live today, is my home county. Now, when I read the article in the Freelance Star, I said, I want to go to that. My next thought is, I have to speak. So I invited a friend of mine, and I just knew he would agree with me that you need to move that doggone block. He's an African-American young man like I am. And remind you, I am a young man. His comment was, no, it needs to stay. So now that I've listened to these speakers before me, I have an appreciation for both points of view. Perhaps the greatest appreciation that I have for one of the comments is a young lady who said the African-American community should make the decision. Surely the African-American community should weigh heavily in the decision. The other comment that struck me was when I heard people say, you cannot move it to a museum because it would become <laughs> hidden. What I would encourage each and every one of you to do is visit the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis. I'm a motorcyclist. I ride my motorcycle all over the country to visit museums. And when you go into the African American Museum, the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, and you see the burnt out bus, and you see all of these things, the lunch counters, it makes an impression. You get the whole story. The block sitting here in Fredericksburg does not tell the whole story. Visit the trail of Tears Museum in Oklahoma. When I visited, I could hear my Native American brothers and sisters crying. I stood there so moved, because you can feel it. I also ride my motorcycle all over the country to go to blues festivals. So I'm down in Mississippi at a blues festival, and I see this interpretive panel. This is where they kept the Native Americans in the dead of winter. Time, sir. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Ronette Cooper, and in 1995, as a Mary Washington student, I had the privilege of having the civil rights hero, Dr. James Far Farmer, as my professor. Later, I became his caregiver right before he passed away. And this gave me a lens and appreciation for what the, the successes and the feats and the trials of the civil rights movement. I also am a pastor in this, in this region. In regards to the slave auction block, I've come full circle. In 1995, when I first saw it, I went to take an ax to it and chop it down myself. And then, as this poll started to come out, as the events in Charlottesville unfolded, I started to go, you know, maybe there's a compromise here. Maybe we can put up panels. Maybe we can put something that says um, that, you know, we need to describe this block for what it is. And a horrible time period in American history involving the, the enslavement of people. And then I started to realize that was actually my compromise. What I didn't want to happen is violence. What I didn't want to happen was something that would trigger um, outrage and race um, uh, f fights and things like that. I wanted constructive dialogue. And when I say I come full circle, I start to think, what would I do if I saw them removing this slave auction block? And I realized I would start weeping tears of joy. And I realized, oh my gosh, I actually feel really passionate about this. Now, I'm a history teacher, and I'm all for keeping history. But I want the full picture. That slave auction block is like the first letter of a word. 
It does not tell the complete story. And so I feel like not only do we owe it to ourselves to put it in context, I'm not saying a museum, but I am saying in context, not where you can eat pizza and gaze over and see somebody jump on it, okay? We need to put it in context. You don't walk to the concentration camps in Germany and have a piece of pizza looking at the ovens. You don't do that. It's in context. We need to have the complete story, and I, or at least a sentence or a paragraph or something more. So for me, I've come full circle. I've come from let's chop it down to let's leave it there. All we, want, we don't want any kind of tension in the city. We don't want a repeat of Charlottesville to, in my heart of hearts, I'm like, you know what? If I would rejoice if that thing's moved, it's a source of pain for seconds. me. I think of what of my, which of my ancestors were on that block, which ones were humiliated. And yes, there's a history lesson to be learned from it. Yes, there is. But it's just one lesson of many. And one of those lessons we can do is that we can come together, we can learn from our history, but we can forge the future together if we listen to each other with love. Thank you. Thank you. Bethany. Bethany w Wilson. <laughs> Bethany Wilson and John C. Sweet. Hi, my name is John C. Sweet. My parents moved to Fredericksburg in uh, the early 80s, and I came to visit them shortly thereafter. And I fell in love with Fredericksburg. I remember wandering uh, down Fauquier Street and seeing a little cottage, and I thought, oh, I, I'd like to buy that and fix it up. And 10 years later, I did. And I've lived here in Fredericksburg since 1991. Uh, my house is very old. It is uh, pockmarked with uh, Union soldier bullets. Uh, I love the history of this town. This town speaks to me. Um, I live right down from the, the block, and every time I go by it, I see it, I look for it, and it means something to me. It speaks to me of the fabric of life, and some of that fabric is good and some of that fabric is bad. And I, I will be honest with you, it never occurred to me until Charlottesville how much pain the monuments have given to some of my fellow citizens. I did not realize it until then. But to me, the block is different. To me, the block is like a holy relic that speaks to us of something that we must not forget. And I am of the mind that if we take it away and we put it in the museum, most likely none of us will ever see it again. And if we do not see it, we will forget it. This is not a cancer that needs to be removed. It is, an, uh, it is a, something that we need to cherish and we need to respect it. And we need to show ourselves and the people that come to this town to visit that we recognize what this means. We feel everything that this means. We respect everything that this means. And we want to never forget what it means. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hashmel Turner, Jane Seaman. I'm Hashmel Turner. I had written something out to say, but I think I'll put it right back where I just got it from. I served on the Fredericksburg City Council, so in 2005, I asked that the slave block be removed. I remember reading about back in 1924, I believe, city council members considered having a block removed. In 2005, when I asked to have it removed, at that time, a proposal was on the table to have the United States a National Slavery Museum brought to the city of Fredericksburg. And I thought 
that's a good artifact to go in the National Slavery Museum. Well, here we are in 2017. The discussion is back on the table. Options before us, neither that I agree with, but one I'm willing to compromise, option B. I think about the fact that those say that it needs to be a reminder. I think about another reminder. When slaves were in the hulls of the ships and they were asked to come up on the deck, sometimes there were those that were disobedient. And when they were, they were beheaded. The heads were chopped off and put on a pole. So when the others came out as a reminder, don't be disobedient, they had to rub their hands on the head of the one that was on hand, the head that was on the pole. I don't need that reminder on the city streets of Fredericksburg to remind me that my ancestors were degraded, tortured, and sold as if they were livestock. My family history is that of working in the tobacco, tobacco fields and uh, harvesting the produce. We didn't, have, we didn't have family members working in cotton fields that I'm aware of. But I don't need that reminder on the street of Fredericksburg to remind me of what white people did to black people. Black people shouldn't need to have that reminder there as to what white people did to black people. It should go somewhere where it can be respected. If that's seconds. the case, that, that those that really need that reminder, I don't need that kind of reminder. If I want to remember something of history, I want to be reminded that over 10,000 enslaved people crossed over the Rappahannock on the other side of the Rappahannock, on the Falmouth side, headed north toward freedom. So the block, as a reminder for some, is to keep maybe others in their place. I don't need it to remind me to stay in my place. I know my place. So it needs to go Time's somewhere. Up. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Hi, I'm Jane Seaman, and I am 71, and I don't think I've been in front of people like this since grade school. <laughs> um, I didn't make any notes, and apparently I should have. <laughs> um, I. Every time I pass that slave block, I think of the horrors that a whole people went through. They went through hell, and this was not one guy that, that we can say was a big hero because he did it. This was not a group of 50 people. This was an entire population uh, that, that went through this over long periods of time, centuries. And I just think how strong these people are to have made it through that. And every time I see the slave block, I, I just, that's, that's the reaction that I have, is respect for the black people in this country. Um, just as whenever I hear or see or read anything about the Holocaust in Germany, I have great respect for the Jewish people who made it through, the ones who died in the camps, as well as the ones who made it through, um, two of whom are uh, each individually in different camps, met each other when they came to America after the war, but they are my brother's in-laws. Um, it, it just, it staggers my mind to think of what they went through and how strong these people are. And look what, what great com contributions the Jewish people have made to this country since World War II, and what great contributions the blacks have made to this country throughout history and are still making. And um, I have been made aware during all this discussion the last month or two uh, that it is painful to some black people to have that there. So um, I just want the blacks especially, because I think they ought to carry more weight in this discussion, although we whites ought to have some input, which I'm doing right now. Um, but just to know that to me it's a sign of respect. Um, however, if it is hurtful to the blacks, then I think maybe it should be moved. 
I like some of these ideas that have come up this morning of a plan C. I don't want to see it to go into a museum where it's not going to be visited. I would like the idea of a park where you could tell much more of the story. You could put the story of the 10,000 people who went across the river and, uh, you know, have several um, of those, those boards uh, that tell the story. And so if we could have a, a park or a section of a park where you had more room than just that one corner, maybe a further story could be told. But um, to me, this is a sign of great respect. Thank you. Thank you. Faith Collins Childress, Christy Newby. My name is Faith Collins Childress, and I live here in Fredericksburg on Williams Street. I came here um, because I married a Virginian from Appomattox, um, which is also rich in Civil War history, as you know. Um, I certainly respect that people have a different perspective on history and may have grown up with a different perspective than the one I grew up with. But that change, that fact that history is being memorialized, excuse me, but that does not change the fact that history is being memorialized and leaves a group of people feeling dehumanized and less than. It memorializes the dehumanization of an entire group of people whose backs this country was literally built on. This is not a matter of trying to strip history away or rewrite it either, for that matter. Rather, it is putting history in a proper context to where everyone who carries this history is included. One of my dear African-American friends, in fact, several of my dear African-American friends can trace their history in this community back to the time of slavery. When we, they walk by this block, several of them have told me they wonder if that's where uh, some of their ancestors met some of their cruel um, owners at that time who would beat them pour salt in their wounds. They wonder if their ha families were torn apart on that block. And sometimes we're just going down there on a Saturday morning to have a cup of coffee at Hyperion or to buy a steak at the butcher shop. So again, I'm here to support those friends, but if they feel that way, then it, I believe that it is their opinion that should banner most. One who has, one of these women who has two young children, she said it this way, African American children should not have to grow up in the shadows of these artifacts, of these statues, walk down streets that speak to their dehumanization. As a student of history, you can elect to go to a concentration camp or to Jefferson Davis's home. I myself lived in Nuremberg, Germany for a time where Hitler built his stadiums and held his big rallies. They, 30 seconds. They have um, memorialized it, memorialized that history in different ways. But it was a Jewish community that spoke the strongest on that. So moving these things does not get rid of racism. However, it may help heal the racial wounds, bring peace to the hearts of our fellow citizens and friends where there has been history of trauma and it might bring racial unity in our city. If so, we should not idealize a stone, a statue, a street name, an artifact, or even history itself over our beloved living, breathing friends and neighbors. Time, ma'am. Thank you. I'm Christy Newby. Uh, thank you, City Council, for giving the community the opportunity to speak. When I first heard of this desire for the slave auction block to be taken down, my heart immediately resisted. I thought, no, don't take it down. It has really impacted me. It helps me to see the visual and to reckon with the reality of our inhumane history. But then the questions rose to my heart of, why should the way it impacts me have a greater weight than the much deeper and painful impact it has on many of our black community members or even visitors? 
Shouldn't the opinion matter more of those who have been most deeply and directly impacted by our horrific history of which this is a remnant? A few weeks ago, the desire for the slave auction block to be removed was news to me. I've walked by and driven by countless times, and it has often impacted my heart when I choose to stand and give it moments of reflection. But I never realized that it has been a source for deep hurt to part of my community, including my friends when they simply walk or drive by. I was ignorant of this. I didn't know. How could I have known unless I was told? But now I have been told, and now Fredericksburg has been told. We do not have the excuse of ignorance anymore. I want to say to the black community, I'm sorry for my ignorance. Thank you for speaking up, and please keep speaking up. There are many who now hear and are listening. To the city council, again, thank you for choosing to hear from the community. My point is this. I believe we must give great and even greater weight to the voices from our black community, even if the population numbers are fewer. The prospect of listening to these voices and then failing to take action in kind deeply concerns me. I believe to do so may actually have the opposite effect of reconciliation and healing. We may actually deepen the wound. We are no longer simply ignorant. If we do not listen and act accordingly, I fear our message will be this. Though we now know this dreadful artifact from history hurts you, it doesn't matter. Or at least it doesn't matter as much as its impact on me matters. Why should the consensus of the black community be given more weight? Because it was their ancestors who stood on that block. It was their ancestors who were brutalized. It was their family. To me, justice and humility both say, how do you want your ancestors to be honored? And whether it's moving the block to a place of remembrance in a museum and putting a marker in its place, or if it's letting it remain but with proper context added, let's give that choice to those most deeply and personally affected. I believe Fredericksburg is in a moment in history now where we can step into greater unity, reconciliation, and healing than we have known before. I pray we listen and do what is right. Thank you. Thank you. Lee Lewis and Mark Kramer. My name is Lee Lewis. I live here in Fredericksburg. I'm 68 years old. I've been away maybe eight years. That's Stone has been a thorn in my side since I was 12 years old, marching parades, Boy Scout Troop 569, Walker Grant Band. Also moved, came to JM. I was there in 65 when we selected to um, integrate schools. President of Mayfield Civic Association for five years. I'm that descendant that's been here. And that stone does not weigh anything positive to me. I don't need a stone to remind me about my ancestors. They're in my head. While I'm sitting here, I think about Kunte Kente. And I like what Kunte Kente, he always strived for freedom, no matter what you did for him. And thinking of seeing that stone, that stone does not make me want to do anything. I don't need history about that stone. Put history in books. When I was in school and I'm looking for something about us, black people, I can't find anything. And I don't know whether it's changed that much today. But if you want to reserve history, put it in the books. We got other medias here, and thank goodness for movies, roots, underground railroad, and I'm glad to see all this stuff is coming out. There's so many things you can do and find out about history. And I think the proposal B, putting in the museum, is great. And if someone wants to go to the museum, they'll go there. And if the city needs to subsidize the museum or try to find grants or something so people have more access, worrying about costs, not allowing them, then do so. But that stone, does not do anything for me than bring back sadness, resentfulness, and it doesn't help in healing the community. 
and I don't see anything positive about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mark Kramer. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and ask a question. Now, regardless of what is done with the auction block, move it, leave it, it should be protected and used to help tell the story of slavery in the U.S., both locally, state, nationally, if you will. As a researcher and an analyst, I know context is very important. Slavery was not, is not good. So I have a question. Will the context address the part of U.S. slavery history where blacks owned black slaves and or engaged in the business, the commercial aspect, of buying and selling persons? Yes, the numbers of, of black slave owners may be small, owning a few or hundreds, but black slave owners existed. The U.S. slavery issue is not straight white owners, black slaves. It's much more complicated. How do we tell that story? Now, I asked the question based on limited research. In the earlier 2000s is where I first ran across the topic in bank merger stories and Harvard professor Gates where he pointed out some research that's a hundred years old. It's a topic that wasn't brought up in any of my history classes, my doctorate program, textbooks, or any of the 40 plus years of government and military classes, race relations and others. So I'm closing on a personal note during my first 18 years of life, I moved back and forth between the Deep South and Upper North Central U.S. Kind of gives me a, early on, a more diverse outlook on, on certain subjects. So in closing, the question is, how do we use it in context to help teach our history? Thank you. Thank you. James Anderson and Jimmy McKinney. <clears throat> I'm James Anderson. <clears throat> I uh, am an <clears throat> amateur student of history and a graduate of German. <laughs> I'm also a Civil War reenactor, and I play both sides. <clears throat> when I play a, the Union side, I'm an abolitionist. And this is at a time in 1860 when the Supreme Court had ruled under Dred Scott that blacks are not anything but property, and they cannot be a citizen. So who spoke for the blacks? abolitionists did and we spoke out for them but today I want to speak out for a piece of rock this stone was chipped away from its fellows family friends drug away and sold to an owner that molded it into a stepping stone for people to get up on their horse or into their carriage. <clears throat> so this is a fine job, but then it became abused and people were being sold on it. Did it have any say in the matter? No, it's property. So here we are today and now people look upon this stone as a monster and they're willing to cross the street and to walk by it. Now, how many people can relate to that story? I say that city council has to come up with a decision 
on whether this stone can, can bask in the sun where it's been for its, most of its life or be put away, away from most of society. So it's up to city council. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Jimmy McKinney. Um, I'm a uh, newly licensed agent with U.S. Health Advisor for two weeks. I've been here in Fredericksburg for seven years, though. And the reason why is because I was assigned here as a military officer, and I just recently decided to retire, and I decided to make Fredericksburg my home after 28 years of service. Okay? And how did I get to that point of 28 years? And I'll tie in the context here. Um, is that I met my uncle who was married to my aunt 40 years ago. Over 40 years ago, I met him for the first time. <laughs> and uh, he had lost his arm in World War II. And of course, being that young and meeting him for the first time, it just took me back. I had never seen someone, you know, was uh, disabled at that moment in my life. And yet, he was vibrant, he was focused, he loved life, he loved everything he did, and he did not have anything negative to say about his experience. He, told, he taught me how to learn from my experiences. He taught me how to make them a foundation for your future. That one guy, I grew up, he inspired me, and I think I made a difference. That, I think, is what this is all about. When people come by that particular artifact, they look at it. And descendants have also spoken at this very moment, sharing with you how it has inspired them through generations to make a difference in their lives. And it was because they came in contact with that one item at that one point in time in their lives. It changes people. You hide it away, you're going to lose that, con that opportunity to make an impact, as he did with me. Thank you very much for this time. Thank you. Robin Nemo, Kim Harmon. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Robin Nemo. I live in Fredericksburg. Um, I just want to say that that stone is a little bit personal to me, and as you can see by looking at me, I'm obviously not of African American heritage. The reason that that stone is personal to me is because uh, I have the privilege of being a guide, a licensed tour guide for the city of Fredericksburg. And it is uh, my job, I look at it as a privilege, to uh, walk the streets and tell people both local and tourists of our history. Um, that artifact on that corner, that tells a lot. Without it being there, I don't have a conversation with people. I can't tell them the history, and more importantly, I cannot see the reaction that they have after I tell them. I can't hear their inflection in their voice. I can't hear that empathy come out for the poor people that went through that. I cannot see the revulsion on their faces of the fact that it even happened. You can put it in a museum, but people aren't going to walk by it. I'm not going to be able to take them by it. I'm not going to be able to give them that part that's so important. We don't need to put a plaque there. We don't need to erect a statue. We already have the original artifact. It speaks the story for itself. Fredericksburg is very lucky to have that there and the fact that we don't have to put something there to remember. It is there. It tells its own story. It doesn't need me. I help it along. But the fact that you take that away, history, history belongs to everyone, not just certain um, factions, not just certain individuals. Um, I tell the tale not only of the slavery trade, but I tell of the white overseers. 
I tell of the economy of the southern states. I encompass every part of history that I can tell a person by one artifact. You take that away or you move it and you take some of that history away. So I'm here just to let everyone know that obviously I am for um, option A. I'd like to keep that auction block and even, um, you know, put some panels around so that when I'm not there, that that story can be told by anyone in words. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Kim Harmon. I live here in Fredericksburg now for five years. I uh, work with Robin. I am a licensed uh, tour guide as well. And basically, I say the same thing as, as Robin has. I do go with uh, option A when I do tell those stories to see their faces, for them to ask questions. It, it, brings up discussions that we talk about the whole way through the, uh, the tour. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Victor Catlett. Okay. All right. Maybe that's a good idea to leave it right here. <laughs> My voice carries, so I, I don't need a microphone. But um, yeah, I want to say as an expert in the subject and in the topic, as a black man, as a reincarnated soul walking through past, present, and into the future, um, as I walk by it, I uh, see the jubilation statue or the sculpture of the jubilation down the hill with bushes surrounding it and I see the slave block and its prominence at the top of the hill uh, still shining that shadow. Um, so I would say that uh, I'm glad I'm blessed to be um, one of the later speakers because I don't, I don't, you know, can just reiterate uh, and say that I, I agree with the, the C. There are those that said that there should be a C. There should be a C option. I agree with that. I agree with um, those that said that the African American decision should be made. I don't believe that um, any, you know, those people that seek to tell the history, they're guessing. Um, you can try to tell it, you can try to tell it your way, you can try to tell it your way, but, and that's what I say when, when those that walk by it, they can, they can assume, they can assume their way, they can assume their way. But if you put it within its context, um, those statues, if you, um, those statues of those Confederate soldiers, if they were in their context, um, they would be in the grave. So um, if they were in their true context, they'd be in the grave. So if this is in its true context, it would be in a grave. And the grave is the museum. And if you want that education, go seek it, just like black people have to go seek theirs. So if you want your education, don't get it on our backs. You know, the education that you're seeking is a conscious education, an education in a conscience that you should have known from the beginning. So, so for you all to kind of seek for this conscience that you should have had, you know, um, it's a waste of time. And the, the black people should be the ones to make the decision, um, I would say. So um, it's great. Uh, I would say on, on the notion of white privilege, I will speak the entirety. Uh, on the notion of white privilege as African American, there is tension within my body to use the restroom in this environment. I don't like it. I should feel comfortable to get up and go use the restroom whenever I feel 30 like seconds. It. So this is what white privilege is. Um, you're able to walk by it and feel some kind of way. We know how we feel when we walk by it. And I want to say that the African Americans that had the initial response to get it removed and then in, in time and how that you know, time and space will cause you all to you know, feel a bit different. But the initial response, as educators say, is the one you should go with. And the initial response of these time, black sir. people have been to remove it. 
So that's the initial response. Thank you. I'm going to have to I'm going to have to stick to the rules, but this much I'm going to say, and I'll say this to all of you. To anyone who has not um, been able to speak today, we are accepting comments throughout um, the period of time up to noon on Monday. And you can present your written comments um, to Tanya, and, and we, we are reading every single one of them and paying attention to every single one of them. But I have to respect the rules today that only the people who are speaking here are those who signed up prior to 8.30 this morning. I'm sorry, sir, if you didn't know you needed to sign up. Huh? But, but everyone who spoke here had to sign up prior to coming. I'm sorry. There was something. Yeah. Um, Thank you. I don't envy the city council's job in this decision. Um, but I'm very grateful that you're doing it. And, and my little sermon at the beginning, I think we saw the best of America here today in how people spoke and how they listened to each other. And thank you for the privilege of being your moderator. Thank you, Dr. Sam. Um, I, I, I cannot thank you enough for, <laughs> you gonna cut me off? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> the rules are the rules. Um, I, I can't thank you all enough. Uh, it, it does make you proud to be an American. It makes you proud to be from the Fredericksburg area. Um, you, you, you have presented very thoughtful and sincere comments, and you've listened to each other, as we will continue to do. Um, as I said before, we are still accepting input through the online form, which is found at fredericksburgva.gov forward slash slave auction block. We are, all of us, receiving emails, which we are compiling along with those online comments. And the gentleman who wished to speak, please come forward. If you've got anything in writing, we present it. We will put it in with um, the, the, the minutes this, 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 um, this morning. Um, truly, with knowledge comes understanding, and as someone said, with understanding comes empathy. We cannot understand each other if we do not know each other's stories. And I think it has been said over and over today that we must know, understand, and remember the stories to, to truly appreciate the horror of slavery and to appreciate what we have done as a nation to overcome it and will continue to do to overcome the vestiges of all that it, all that it represents. Thank you again um, for your, um, your participation today and your respect. And I appreciate this community so much because you do, you are engaged. And I assure you, your counsel is listening. Thank you. <laughs>